Good morning. Well, following the completion after a number of years of going through Revelation, I just wanted to uh, do something of a summary that ties some of these things we've considered together. I'm hoping to pull together much of the scriptures that talk about the Lord's return. So sorry if it's rushed. I'll be putting the verses on the screen, but do pause it as and when you feel the need to and read it for yourselves. As I've highlighted before, I see in Scripture there's just one event, the Lord's return. I don't find in Scripture a secret rapture, a pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib, or an intraseal rapture. I simply see the Lord's return to the earth and our gathering together to Him as He comes. However, I know many friends, I know many Bible teachers who I have great respect for take a different view. View. So this isn't me saying I'm right and they are wrong. This is simply my understanding from the scriptures after studying the topic over some time. It must be tested in scripture. The challenge is always for us to lay down our current understanding and to come to the word and let it speak for itself. So let's pray for the Lord's help as we do that now. Lord, you know, for some this becomes a thorny issue, uh, even for some a, a point of division. Lord, we acknowledge and come to you humbly, Lord, and ask you for your help as we look at your word. Lord, if I'm wrong, correct me. Lord, if I uh, have got things out of balance, correct me. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us through your word. We pray that you would give us greater understanding, Lord, and that this wouldn't be a point of contention, but rather a point where we consider this matter afresh, look at it afresh, and go back to Scripture, and as uh, others were encouraged to do, to see if these things are so. Lord, may it be so in our case too. Save us from our predetermined determined positions, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. So I'm going to be touching on things uh, I've already said, but hopefully much more focused on why I believe there's only one event. Our terminology even highlights, I think, this idea, the idea of one event. The Lord's return, the second coming, when he comes again. We use these phrases. When we use them, what do we mean? We say the Lord is coming, the Lord Jesus is coming, he's returning. Where to? Let's go to Acts chapter 1 and we'll read from verse 9. I'm going to be... Uh, all these references in your American Standard Version. Um, Acts chapter 1 from verse 9. Spoken to his followers. After he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, two men, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come again just in the same way you have watched him go into heaven. Where are they when this was said? The Mount of Olives. Where is Jesus coming back to? The Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 verse 3. For the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. So we know where the Lord is coming to when he returns. I don't think there's really any dispute about where he is coming to. The Christians know it. The Jews know that the Messiah is coming to the Mount of Olives. That's why they have all those graves there on the Mount of Olives. And the Muslims know it too. That's why they've blocked up the entrance to the city and put a cemetery there as if that's going to stop the Lord coming. So everyone agrees that when he returns, he will return to the Mount of Olives and then enter the city. Has Jesus done this journey before? You should remember, we celebrate it every year. It's interesting that that event is given such prominence. Matthew 21. If you've got headings in your Bible, what's the heading say? The triumphal entry. Why is it called the triumphal entry? It wasn't that triumphal. But where does that triumphal journey, entry journey start? Verse 1. 
when they approached Jerusalem, they had come from Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. They start their journey with a triumphal entry on the, on the Mount of Olives. And skip over to John's account, chapter 12 and verse 12. John's account, chapter 12, verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. They went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They went out to meet him. Friends, when the Lord Jesus comes again to the Mount of Olives to enter Jerusalem, we will come out to meet him, I believe, and I hope to demonstrate that shortly. But what do they say? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When the Lord weep, later weeps over Jerusalem, what does he say? Matthew chapter 23 verse 39. Matthew 23 verse 39. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you see? The same place. Same words. The difference will be he won't be on a humble donkey this time, but on a white horse as we see in Revelation 19 verse 11 Revelation 19 verse 11 and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war we've just read and saw heaven opened and as he went away after his ascension heaven was opened and it talked about a cloud receiving him out of their sight. So we know where Jesus is returning to, the Mount of Olives. And we're seeing a shadow of that triumphal entry. So then the question is, how will he come back? What will it be like? Well, we've just read the clouds will receive him and that he will return in like manner as he ascended in Acts. And in Revelation 19, the heaven is opened uh, when he returns to the earth. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. Now understand this passage is firmly put down as describing the rapture by those who believe in separate events. But what I'm seeking to do here is to show that these descriptions in, script, in scriptures all have the same elements of the same descriptions. What do we see here in this passage that apparently is about the rapture as a separate event from the Lord's return. You see the Lord descending from heaven. We see the shout of heaven and trumpets, the voice of archangels. We see the dead raised and those who are alive meet the Lord in the air. Now if these are two distinct events, why are they all being described in the same way? All these events describe the coming, the Lord coming. But those who put, believe in the pre-trib rapture would have us believe that the Lord does a U-turn, that he comes halfway down and then goes back up again. Why does he need to leave heaven at all? If he is just bringing us to him in heaven, he could just raise us. It also doesn't fit what the believers were told at his ascension that he would return in like manner. The rapture, as is described and taught, is not about his coming, but it's about the church's going. But we don't see that in scripture. The focus is always on the Lord Jesus coming again, his return. At the end, I'm going to finish by reading 25 verses. They all talk about the same thing, the Lord coming, 
That's always a focus, not on our going. The other thing that is taught, not by everyone who believes in a pre-trip rapture, but by the majority, is that only the believers will see it. Now, Thomas Ice makes this point in his paper, Why I Believe the Bible Teaches Rapture Before the Tribulation, where he says only his own will see him. But wherever we see the Lord's return described, there are things to see and hear. And we are told in various places that every eye will see him, although Thomas Ice seeks to make that one of the differences. I may take some time going through Thomas Ice's paper at length separately, because he is considered one of the strongest uh, proponents of a pre-trip rapture, but I don't have time for all that now in this message. But a large portion of his paper is trying to show a difference between what he sees as these two events. Where again, I think the reality is what we see in scripture is that all these descriptions are similar to each other. I think the best way to do that really is to put the scriptures up and highlight all the ways in which they use the same descriptions. So sorry if this isn't very flowing and fluid, but hopefully then you can see it for yourselves from the word of God and not from the teaching of man. So firstly, the Lord descends. We've already seen it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, and it's alluded to in Zechariah 14 with his feet standing on the Mount of Olives. In Acts at the Ascension, the clear inference is the Lord will descend again from the, with, from the clouds of heaven. Other places phrase it differently, talking about the Lord coming with the clouds of heaven and everyone seeing him. So in, we see that in Matthew 24. Let's go there, Matthew 24 from verse 29. When's it going to happen? But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Signs to be observed and seen and heard. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see him, see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. It's the same in Mark uh, chapter 13 verse 24. But uh, in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be fallen from heavens and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. In Luke chapter 21 verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Here heaven opened, while it doesn't say it there, we know he is descending to the earth to deal with the enemy, as we read the passage further on. All these passages use either the term descending from heaven or coming with the clouds of heaven. Just remember again what it says in Thessalonians. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Yet some would say half of them refer to the rapture of the believers away from the earth before the tribulation and the other half are about the Lord's return. Yet there is no such distinction in the text. It's just not written there. Let's go to the next element found. Uh, the shout of heaven or the trumpet. Again we've seen in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Is this something we see elsewhere? Yeah. Matthew 24. We are told by others that these are different events to what is being talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15. 
what we've read there, Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will, dis his, he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. We can see it in Old Testament passages like Isaiah 27, verse 13. And it will come about in that day that a great trumpet will be blown and those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and those who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Revelation 11 verse 15 Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And if you remember there are seven trumpets that was the last of them the last trumpet. So again, spread through the various passages, we see the shout of the angels and trumpets. So, but there's no distinction between the two. Those uh, sections where people say, oh, this is speaking of the rapture and this is speaking of the Lord's return and the day of the Lord. They all use the same phraseology. Some time ago I highlighted how trumpets were used to gather people. Well, that brings us on to our next point. The dead are raised and those who are alive will meet the Lord in the air. And it talks about the gathering together of his people. We saw it again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. What about Matthew 24? Matthew 24 verse 31, he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather to the elect, gather together the, his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. The Greek word elect here is repeatedly used in the New Testament about believers in the church. It's used 22 times. Look it up. Don't let me do all your work for you. Look it up. Go and see uh, in a Greek dictionary. See where these places, how this word is used. It's used about believers in the, te in the, in, in the word, in the New Testament. I've never understood how in good conscience people can make out this word might mean something different than how it's used in the rest of scripture. Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse also says it this way. Mark chapter 13 verse 27. And he will send forth his angels and will gather his elect from one of the four winds, from the furthest end of the earth to the furthest end of heaven. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we request you brethren with regards to the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Here, 2 Thessalonians 2 makes it clear, I think, that this is one event. The coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. We also get the day of the Lord also put together with these two in verse 2. That you will not be quickly dis shaken or from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it was from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So Paul puts the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord together with our gathering together to him. This is important because Thomas Ice and so many others put these as separate events. But the Apostle Paul does not. He puts them together. It's important to see because while they will say one passage is talking about the rapture event and one passage is talking about the return of the Lord to the earth, the fact is nowhere in scripture are they described as separate events in the same place. Why isn't it anywhere explained that there are two different events 
in one discourse. Yet here Paul has these supposedly different events together in the same passage and he talks about them at the same time. There are obviously lots of other sim smaller similar similarities you can see when you're going through it. But it's worth noting, nowhere in scripture are we told we won't go through the Great Tribulation. Nowhere in scripture are we told we won't go through the Great Tribulation. I'll qualify that by pointing to the two verses which are often taken to say we won't go through it. So the first is in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. And verse 11 as well. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. I'll read it as it's written. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold on fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So at first reading, you can see why those who are looking for verses to defend the position of a pre-trip rapture would use this verse. The problem here is the Greek word, tereo, which has been translated, keep. Now I hate it when people say, oh, well, this word doesn't really mean that. But do look this up for yourselves. See where this is used. To translate it as keep you from seems to read into the word something that isn't there but the point is look it up see how it's used use a uh, greek dictionary in the lexicon which it, this word means to watch over to guard to keep to preserve or to observe it's found 65 times in the new testament sometimes it is translated keep for example keep the commandment also, keep watch over him, or keep guard over him. Other uses, it's about reserve, preserve, keep, uh, the watch over. In all these various places, it has the idea to preserve. But nowhere else is it translated, keep from. This is God promising to watch over and preserve his people during this time of testing. Please see it for yourself. Don't take my word for it, because it is important in this instance. The translation has made quite a bit of difference. Check it out for yourself. See what I'm saying is so. The 65 other references, you can see how this word is used and translated there. Of course, it certainly doesn't say I will take you out of the time of testing. Even if the Greek word did suggest how it's translated, which it doesn't, it still isn't explicitly saying we will not go through the Great Tribulation. The second verse which people take is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. But they very often only quote the first half of the verse. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath. And so they apply that to the Great Tribulation, where we see bowls of wrath being poured out on the earth, which could be a reasonable ap application. Of course, it doesn't say that God has not appointed us to, to the Great Tribulation. What is the whole verse? Though? Verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been saved from the wrath of God. We were by nature children of wrath. He that does not believe on the Son, the wrath of God abides on him. We will not experience the wrath of God in hell because of his salvation. God's wrath is seen throughout the word of God. In the past, and that was seen whilst people were there, particularly see the children of Israel. When you look at the judgments that are poured out, those bowls of wrath, see how in Exodus those plagues are similar to the plagues of Egypt. But the children of Israel were in Goshen. They were kept 
They were preserved. They weren't taken out of it. They were in there at the same time. But they were preserved. But here, So all the way through, we see God's wrath being poured out on the earth whilst believers are around in the past. We see in the future there is God's wrath and we see in the final judgment there is God's wrath when people are appointed to hell and judged because of the failure to follow the Lord and turn to the Lord. So let's read verses 8 and 9 again of this passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 Since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for, for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the immediate context of this verse is about salvation. However, earlier it does talk about the day of the Lord. But even considering that, why is Paul telling them about what will take place on the day of the Lord if we aren't going to face it? He's obviously already taught them about it because he says, I don't want you to be unaware. In other places he says, you're not ignorant to these things. Why did Jesus tell his disciples all about the great tribulation and give them warnings of the Antichrist if they were never going to see it? Obviously, I have to concede it's not unreasonable to take this passage as inference we might not go through the Great Tribulation. But it's not explicit. Nothing like is as explicit as what Jesus taught his followers. Let's just see how that discourse on the Mount of Olives starts there in Matthew chapter 4, 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when, we see these things, when will we see these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Notice who asks and what they ask. Who asks? The disciples privately. So he's not teaching in a crowd of people. So it's the disciples privately. The future leader of the leaders of the church, the writers of the gospel, these are people that are going to take the message out. Most of them will take the message out way beyond Jerusalem. Yes, most of them were Jews, but they are his followers. They are not unbelievers. And what do they ask? They ask about the signs before his coming and the end of the age. The clear inference is that they believe that Jesus will return at the end of the age. And Jesus does nothing to say to them, well, when I come again, I will take you away, and then all these things will happen to those who believe. They, the disciples are coming and asking Jesus what it will be like when he comes, how it will be, what will happen. And Jesus at no point says, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to rescue you from these things, that you're not going to go through it. Why doesn't he do that? Why is it not given? Why is that information not there? Yes, it's an argument from silence, but it's also the most expansive teaching on the end times. And Jesus doesn't mention a rapture. Why? It says... All these things will happen. And he, as he goes through this passage, as he explains these things to the believers of what's going to happen, all the way through, he addresses it as if they will go through it. Through all of it. Let's read from verse, let me just pick out the verses. Verse 4, he says to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name therefore when you see the abomination of desolation when you see the abomination of desolation verse 15 uh, verse 21 then there will be a great tribulation okay verse 24 so as to mislead if possible even the elect 
the elector there, verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe them. And verse 26. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go up. He is talking to his followers, the writers and the teachers of the Gospels. And he is explicitly saying, after the tribulation, after the great tribulation, the Lord will return. Nowhere does he tell them that he's going to take them out. It's in, it's in keeping with the rest of scripture. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul says, writes to say, the Lord won't return until these things take place. In Revelation, given to John, um, record to recorded and given to believers, it's the same. While much of the the fact, while many make much of the fact that the word church doesn't appear after chapter three, well, actually it does. It appears in chapter twenty-two, verse sixteen, and it says this: "I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches." Revelation, all of it is for the church. And nowhere does it suddenly say, okay, there's a change in chapter 3. We can all see it. But it doesn't say in chapter, at the end of chapter 3, and then the Lord will take his church away. And these things will happen. Revelation is for the church. But notice, the word brethren is used in, later in Revelation. Let's see chapter 6 and verse 11 of Revelation. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been killed, would be complete also. Revelation 12, again the word brethren, Revelation 12 from verse the second part of verse 10. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down he who accuses them before God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and because they did not love their life even when faced with death. But much more so, the word saints is used 13 times in Revelation. The word saints is used 13 times in Revelation. All of them after chapter 3. All of them after chapter 3. Paul in his writing uses the word saints almost as much as he uses the word church. See it for yourselves. So don't rely on sound bites like there's no mention of the church after chapter 3. Check out what's being said. Does it stand up? Well, finally, I just want to hammer home this last point. How many verses... Can you find that talk about our going? That focus on that we are leaving the earth. Not when we die, but in some sort of rapture. The reason I ask is because over and over and over again, the focus of scripture is not on our going, but on his coming. He will come again. He is coming. To where? Midair? Let me paint a picture for you. I'll take a situation that happened to me once. I had a friend, let's call him Paul, who was going to Scotland. One of his other friends, who he was going to stay with, let's call him Bob, was going to go and pick him up and take him back to Scotland. To save Bob coming all the way to, we, the way to take Paul to Scotland, I took Paul halfway, and we met Bob at a service station, and Bob took him, from there back to Scotland. Now, if you're Bob writing to Paul, how would you describe that? Probably something like, I'll meet you and take you to Scotland. Because that's the point of the event, is to take Paul to Scotland. Now, if Bob was coming to stay here with Paul, rather than Paul pick up, rather than pick Paul up and take him to Scotland, he would write to Paul and say about how he was coming to him. 
even if Paul was going out to meet him halfway, it would still be about them coming to them. The Lord doesn't write about us going to him or about our going away. He writes overwhelmingly to us about his coming, his return. He is coming to where we are. We will meet him in the air. That separation from the wheat and the tares will take place. But he is coming to Mount Zion to rule and to reign. And we are going out to meet him, just as they did at the tri his triumphal entry to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And again, we will say, as they did on that day, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is coming. Don't take my word for it. Here it is in the scriptures. There are more, but I've just selected 25 verses. I'm just leaving aside some of the ones we've already looked at. Okay. Matthew 16, verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some of you, uh, of those standing here, who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew 24, verse 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man will be like just like the days of Noah. Verse, 20, verse 39 of the same chapter. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So the will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 42 of the same chapter. Therefore be on your alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Verse 44, same chapter. For this reason you must all... For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't think he will. Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I will tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Coming on the clouds of heaven. Mark Chapter 13, again, the Olivet Discourse, all talking about his coming. In chapter 14, again, before the high priest, he talks about his coming. In Luke chapter 12, verse 40, you too be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Luke 21, verse 27, then you will see the Son of Man coming on in a cloud with power and great glory. 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 23, each in his, but each in his own order. For Christ the firstfruits, and after that those who are Christ at his coming. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19. For who is our hope or joy or the crown, or the crown of exaltation? Is it not even you? In the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13 so that he may establish in your hearts without blame in holiness before the Lord, before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 For we say this to you by word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, regarding regards to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. 1 Thessalon uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. James chapter 5 verses 7 and also verse 8 Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. For the, the farmer waits for the produce, precious produce of the soil, being patient about it 
until he gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. 2 Peter 3 verse 4, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? John 1 John chapter 2 verse 28, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11, I am coming quickly, hold fast what, what you have, so that no one will take away your crown. Revelation 22, in verse 7, And behold, I am coming quickly. In verse, um, verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly. In verse 20, He who tests about these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, dear friends. He is coming to rule and to reign. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Well, Father, we've rushed through these scriptures in many ways. Lord, we pray that you'd help us if we need to, to go back, look over them. Lord, we pray that everything would be tested. Lord, we pray that we would examine, that we would search, that we wouldn't sit back and lean on our own understanding of what we know so far. Lord, we thank you that you're not done teaching us. Lord, as we go through our lives, Lord, we thank you for the many times you've corrected and changed our thinking. Lord, we look to you. Lord, we want to be right on this subject. Lord, I want to be right. I don't want to just trust in what I've learned thus far. Lord, if you've got more to teach me, Lord, and I'm sure you have, Lord, we look. I look forward to that and seek and I pray that you'd help me to search your word. And Lord, I pray that for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That we would search the scriptures and see if these things are so. Save us from our preconceived ideas, we pray, Lord Jesus. Teach us, we pray. Humble us. But Lord, also keep us unified. Even though we may disagree on these issues, Lord, we thank you that our hope is in the Lord. That we are looking to you. Lord, we pray that you prepare us for the days that are ahead of us. But Lord, that we would keep in close fellowship with one another, all the more as these days draw near. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.